So what are we doing today, JC? I've been watching these YouTube videos about living on Bitcoin for a day and they trigger me because <laughs> I live on Bitcoin every day. Well, I would like to have money controlled by a computer. However, that's not what's happening. And I'm a realist. Let's take a closer look at the apps we use for most of the day. These are Breeze and Fold. Fold is where we get the gift cards so that we can spend anywhere. Uh, plus, we get a discount and get Bitcoin back. Um, a lot of different options, but I'm a coffee fiend, so let's do Starbucks for our little demo. There's a couple different ways to pay. I can use my previous rewards, but we don't want to do that right now. Uh, and if you hit lightning, you'll see that we can actually pay with credit card. So you can actually start earning Bitcoin back without actually using Bitcoin to pay. But we're living off Bitcoin for the day, so we're going to use lightning. Plus, our reward is bigger. So we're going to get our 3% back for using lightning and got a thousand bonus sats because I'm awesome. We hit buy card. I'm just going to copy the invoice right here. Then we jump over to the Breeze wallet. It automatically notices the invoice. I hit approve and there we go. Breeze is pretty simple. Send, receive, scan a code. It's just a really good Bitcoin wallet that also takes advantage of lightning. You jump back over to fold and there we have it. We got our sats back and we got our Starbucks gift card. Here's a sneak peek of a work in progress, the Bitcoin full node sculpture. It's designed to be a fully functional block explorer and Bitcoin full node. In the final version, you'll be able to actually link this to your full node and output values directly for some of the things like the hash rate, difficulty, block height, block timestamp, and so forth. You'll also be able to find yourself in Bitcoin time, current block height, uh, or block reward, how many Bitcoin are mined at the end of this halving cycle, and so forth. We can yes. literally go anywhere in this town we want to go and find a way to pay with Bitcoin. Whether we have to use full with the Breeze wallet has a built-in marketplace with bit refill and thousands or hundreds of merchants. Whether we want to use the Cash app, which we can send Bitcoin to and spend our cash card on. We can do anything with Bitcoin. Do you want to go see if we can buy something at Target? We can do that. So, question from XRP Moonshine, aka Matthew. Why do you still believe in Bitcoin when there are far better, faster, cheaper, more sustainable digital assets out there with actual utility like XRP? I'm trying to get Guy Swan to use Ripple because, you know, it's the future of money, right? It is the future. See, the thing, the, the problem with Bitcoin is that it's so damn expensive. Ripple is only $4. It tastes like shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I always tell people, my opinion doesn't matter, right? It, just look what the market has decided. And so far, the market's decided that Bitcoin's the most valuable uh, digital currency. Um, and, and I understand that there's plenty of other options. Some people believe other things are going to be more important or more valuable. Uh, but so far, the market's determined that uh, Bitcoin is the most valuable. And the key part about money is that money is a belief system. And uh, right now, the market believes that Bitcoin is more money than anything else. Uh, and until that changes, um, I'm not going to fight a market with millions of people all moving in the same direction. I've always found that there's two major themes in Bitcoin. The one I've been most interested in from the beginning is the theme of economic exclu exclusion or the ability to create economic inclusion through an open system to bank the unbanked and underbanked to serve the other six billion. And that's one theme that, that is important right now. If I have a Bitcoin, right, I can send money to my relatives who are in Malawi or in Namibia or in Ghana. Currently, I can't. Uh, with our own currency, I can't send money out freely and quickly. But if we can sit down as a community and say, okay, we need to buy a new borehole and we can do that just by using our phones, that's an amazing thing. You know, if we look at it from a place of development, if we look at it from a place of helping the community and taking care of each other, if it allows us to take care of each other without having to create so many barriers and so much red tape to get stuff done with money. I feel like when you change that narrative, 
you speak to something very deep within an African. And then there's this other theme that I think is fairly recent over the past three or four years that has gotten a lot of attention, which is kind of the monetary maximalist theme in Bitcoin, the, um, the, which has spawned a, a bunch of memes from the to the moon to the hyper Bitcoinization concept, stacking sats, money printer goes brrr. <laughs> you know, all of these memes that are coming out. And, and that has never been my primary interest in, in Bitcoin. I never came at this from an economist perspective because I'm not an economist or from a monetary perspective. To me, that's an interesting side story to an open protocol for money is the monetary policy of that open protocol. To other people, that's the central theme. The monetary policy is the central theme and the open protocol is secondary. And there's certainly a wide range of use cases in which banks don't compete and large, largely cannot compete. So there's a kind of permanent uh, exclusive area for that Bitcoin can satisfy, you know, to do with permissionless use, um, being universally globally accessible. And I, I think it's really interesting right now because these two different perspectives are, are both highly relevant because we're, we're seeing kind of the, the war on cash accelerate, the need to use money as a surveillance tool accelerate, all of which creates the need for um, open banking and open money protocols for those who are unbanked and underbanked or about to become underbanked, unbanked or controlled through money. Uh, store of value being a kind of secondary benefit that it's an uncorrelated asset the supply is apolitical, so it's kind of mathematical supply. So it has, um, so it, it, there's an advanced concept from uh, precious metals that um, the gold, there's a ratio between the gold that has been mined and the rate at which fresh gold is mined. And so it's, it's measured in years for how many years it would take with new mined gold to produce as much as is it currently in existence above ground. And for gold, it's about 60 years, which is, you know, clearly it's a very scarce metal, and that makes it a good commodity for monetary purposes. Mm -hmm. So if uh, any currency is going to fail sooner or later, don't you include Bitcoin in, in this uh, list? Don't you think that Bitcoin will also fail at a certain point as at other, uh, other, other currencies? Well, it, it could fail, right? But the, the difference is that gold is not being debased away, same as Bitcoin. It's a deflationary asset, right? So every inflationary asset that's been debased or devalued over time ends up uh, disappearing or, or becoming not valuable and ultimately failing. But gold survived for 5,000 years, right? And, and I think Bitcoin has a lot of the same properties of sound money. Um, and, and so I tend to think that Bitcoin won't fall victim to that same um, kind of structure or mechanism because it has those sound money principles. If I'm gonna if I'm gonna put my wealth, if I'm gonna take you know ten thousand dollars and and store them in bitcoms, how do I know that a year or two from now anybody is going to accept them for anything? What if it's a fad and nobody wants them? See, the thing with gold I, is gold has value all by itself. If I, I don't have to be able to spend it, I can melt it down. I can make it into jewelry. I can use it in electronics. It has all sorts of properties that make gold intrinsically value all by itself. Right? It doesn't have to be traded for another product, it can be used. When I ask you about this comparison between this hypothetical gold-backed uh, digital currency and Bitcoin, you seem that you choose Bitcoin because you have, like, you have faith in Bitcoin, but you didn't explain exactly what's the advantage of Bitcoin compared to this uh, gold-backed digital currency. How much gold's in the world? You can't tell me. Nobody can. There's not one person in the world who can answer that question. I'm not putting my wealth there. I can tell you exactly how many Bitcoin exist, right? I can tell you 1,800 Bitcoin today got created, but you, no one can tell me how much gold got dug up out of the ground today. So it's just, a, I can prove it, right? And the transparency and the provability uh, from the scarcity standpoint is much more valuable to me than, uh, 
than gold, which although it has been around for 5,000 years, it does not stand up in terms of uh, the transparency, the information, uh, the accessibility, uh, the divisibility, the portability, all of those things. So if you had to make a short-term prediction for the price of Bitcoin following the halving, would you be able to do that? I have no clue what the price is going to do short term. Um, you know, it's a highly volatile asset. I just say uh, I think that it's going to hit $100,000 by the end of uh, December 2021. That's a, a very well-known prediction of yours.